John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. Uh, today we're, uh, we're graced with the presence of Mansour Farohi. He's a London uh, neurosurgeon. He's going to be presenting Jari 1 malformation diagnosis and management. Uh, and first, let's try to go around and introduce a couple of the panelists. Well, hello, Rafid. Hi, John. I'm Rafid Al-Mahboud. Welcome, everyone. Neurosurgeon in uh, Brighton and London. And I work uh, closely with Mansoor Farugi. He's got uh, lots of experience with KRE1. He leads the um, RCSF MDT here in Brighton, and he's worked in Birmingham where a lot of these concepts started. So he'll, I'm sure he'll mention all of those. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone. I'm okay, very, very yeah. good. Rafiq, Rafiq uh, could you introduce yourself, please? The other Rafiq, another Rafiq. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hi. Me? Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, Rafiq. I'm a young neurosurgeon from Algeria. Okay, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, does Chusi? Can you hear me, does Chusi? Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Desiris Chusi. I'm an ear, nose, and throat uh, surgeon doctor, and I'm here to attend this session. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome. Uh, Abdahab, Abdahab, Abhinhab, is that, am I pronouncing it correctly? Perhaps not. Um, Ahmed Farag? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, hi. Could you introduce uh, yourself, hi. please? Yes, uh, good, uh, good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Adel, uh, originally from Egypt, but I am working in Saudi Arabia. Okay, welcome. Uh, Gerald? Uh, I, I, Yes, I, I found difficulty to uh, receive the link for webinar, although I send you my email. Okay, we'll talk later, okay? Okay, okay. okay. Gerald Musa, Gerald Musa. Perhaps he stepped away. I know Dung is there, Dung Goga. Hello? I know you're there. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm Guga, a resident in neurosurgery in Nigeria. I'm glad to be here. Okay, welcome. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Thank okay, you. Mansur, thanks for taking time to put this together and welcome. It's all yours. Okay, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining in and thank you and welcome to everybody on YouTube and all the other people watching elsewhere and uh, etc. Um, I'm sorry I'm looking a bit tired and disheveled out spent some time in a and e recently with uh, family and relatives and it's been um, really inspiring to see uh, you know with despite one quarter of the world on lockdown and so many difficulties the staff i just want to give a big shout out to them uh, that that they've been absolutely brilliant in in looking after my relative and um, this might be in the medical profession myself to see what's going on in accident emergency and how kind they were it was just um, wonderful and um, you know he's been admitted, and they're keeping a very close eye on him, and we'll see. And it's related to this COVID crisis. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm a neurosurgeon from the southeast of England. Uh, I work in Brighton, but I work in several hospitals, and um, and also um, uh, practicing privileges in London, all that kind of stuff. Um, my my areas of interest. Uh, my specialty training was in vascular, skull based and pediatrics, and I serendipitously got into complex CSF disorders when I spent a few years as a consultant in Birmingham, which I absolutely loved. And hence my interest in Chiari, malformation, syringomyelia, and complexes, complex CSF disorders. Um, the subject of today's talk is really about, it's gonna be in two parts, and I welcome any questions. Um, and we're going to have some case discussions and I'm going to put some questions there. And there's a lot of nuances in this subject. That's why I like it. One of many, many, many reasons, not just because it's very common, because it has so many facets to it. There's a lot of nuances and there's a lot of um, uh, simple points, which in my view and, and others have just been misinterpreted and are just not dealt with appropriately. So we're going to hopefully clarify some things and simplify some things, which are unbelievably simple for, for uh, considering this is neurosurgery. 
And uh, so please do join in those questions. The second part of this presentation on another day, I'm gonna focus on the operative techniques because there's a lot to cover there. There's a lot of variations and I hope Professor Atoll Goel will, will honor us and join us for that one who was our guest in, in Birmingham uh, two years ago uh, for the Kiari meeting. So welcome again, let's crack on. Um, this is a, a few slides I've got from Graham, who really, Graham Flint, who really inspired me to get involved in this subject. And Graham is a retired neurosurgeon, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, um, with huge experience in, in many things in spine disorders, a massive experience in Chiari syringomyelia, um, colloid cyst he's done, dozens and dozens of them. Um, uh, but it was his, his uh, trainer and senior, Bernard Williams, who was a legend really uh, and pioneer of many things and the one who proposed the uh, Williams theory for syringomyelia that um, uh, that had a lot to do with Graham getting into this and then Graham and I he asked me to sort of get involved with the CSF disorders and and of course nationally internationally patients would come there for for these operations and uh, because a lot of the redo and complex disorders would come to Graham from around the UK so uh, Bernard Williams is really a mutual source of inspiration and this is his grave site in Birmingham where we visited and um, and this is going back over two years now where for the Chiari meeting we went to visit him and pay our respects and prayers and uh, this is Graham with Marion his wife there and uh, a number of delegates from China who honored us by coming plus or uh, lots of other people from around the world but this was just a small group that we went visiting. This group from China will come back to absolutely wonderful people and they're really the group uh, and the senior responsible for pioneering a new technique in the operation and minimally invasive technique for dealing with Chiari syringomyelia. Here's Paolo Bolognese, Girish um, there from Birmingham, Graham, many other colleagues uh, and myself in the same meeting and there were of course about I think altogether uh, well over a um, hundred of us there. Uh, now what is Chiari one malformation? This is very important, uh, and uh, Rafi, please feel free to shoot any urgent questions so I can address it on, on, on each slide, but the definition has been vague, and this has been one of the problems. But in, 18, in 1891, it was his first description, really, where Hans Chiari, who was a pathologist, uh, originally trained in, I think, in Vienna, who was working in Prague at the time, and he was very big on anatomical dissections and post-mortems. Uh, and he described, uh, I think the first case was really a 17-year-old who had passed away as a consequence of uh, an infection totally unrelated. I'm not sure if it was a cholera or some, or some of that effect, but he described the piston-like cerebellar tonsillar descent, which had impacted uh, um, past the frame of magnum, and um, uh, a series of other cases were then described. So that was his first description. And then Arnold, um, uh, described a case and the students of Arnold uh, a few years later called this Arnold Chiari malformation attributed them to both and its definition since that time has been vague I'm sorry to say some people say it's extensive of two millimeter beyond the from a magnum most of the world tends to go as far as I'm concerned when we discuss in, in meetings that if it's a protrusion of five millimeters or more sorry salivella tonsillar descent beyond the boundary of the frame of magnum uh, then we say there's a QI1 malformation. It is as simple as that. It is, as it, it is so vague, sadly. But what we should do is pay attention to the characteristics of this descent, of the symmetry or asymmetry of the tonsillar descent, with degree of compaction, uh, or how it's impacted, uh, and whether they're pointed and the deformity, which I'm going to come back to. This is very important, particularly for trainees. It's very important to talk about its prevalence. It's a staggering 1% of the population, some say more, some say a bit less, and up to 3% in children. So it's not a disease, it's an anatomical finding essentially, if you want to put it that way, but its prevalence is huge. And therefore we need to important to define whether the patients are symptomatic uh, and the, the cause for the referral and the detection or imaging, or whether this is incidental. And there's a condition which many of you may have heard of and it's called vomit. And we're going to talk a little bit about this now because this is the most common mode of the presentation of the Chiari 1 malformation. And this goes back to a paper. Can everyone see this? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. So yes. this is um, yes. uh, a, a, quite a, one of these wonderful essays that uh, Richard Haywood wrote uh, and articles. And Richard Haywood is a retired neurosurgeon from Great Ormond Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he described victims of modern imaging technology. And here's a tale of two sets of parents from two different children who had a 
incidentally detected something on a scan, one arachnoid cyst and something else incidentally on a spine. And they waited a while to see him and were very anxious and, and concerned. And he described the, this scenario uh, and, and the, the patients, the parents, as literally victims of modern imaging technology. And he proposed that this is a price that you pay for advanced in technology. And indeed, we're seeing a lot of it. Now, what does it really mean for us? It's a lot of anxiety and fear sometimes when it's so incidental to diagnosis. And I'm talking about diagnosis such as the following. Arachnoid cysts occurs in 0.5% of the population. So if you have an MRI scan, one in 200 will have one of these. A meningioma, the most common uh, tumor within the head, about one in 200 will have a small meningioma or a large one, but usually vast majority small. Chiari malformation, type 1, and almost 1%. Cavernous hemangioma, 0.3%. Aneurysms, 1% to 2%. AVMs, 0.1%. And the list goes on and on. So about 6 to 7% of all brain MRIs, you will find some diagnosis of something, which is quite staggering. And therefore, I mean, this is an example, arachnoid cyst, one in 200. This is another one. This is a large one, which was symptomatic. And all these cases I'm going to show you is operations, cases done by myself or you know, within our team. And um, you know, this was dealt with and, and endoscopically and very nicely, uh, a good outcome, thank God. But this is one, uh, for every one of those, I might see 20 or 30 of incidentally detected asymptomatic, don't need anything doing, arachnoid cyst. Here's a 40-year-old, an academic with this arachnoid cyst, which caused some worry. I need the reassurance that nothing should be done, nothing needs to be done. And almost certainly in the course of his lifetime, nothing is going to be required at all. Here's a man in Germa, occurring one in 200. Here's a Chiari, which is incidental. And it, there's different types of Chiari. Look at this one on the left and then look at the one on the right. Surely you could see that one might be more symptomatic than the other because of the degree of impaction and, and the, the beaking, the pointing and the CSF space obliteration. And um, uh, this was a scan with someone uh, presenting with some facial numbness following difficulties. So they would think, well, is this related to this? You can imagine the anxiety. I would say highly unlikely this was the uh, responsible cause. Uh, but they need to be seen and, and, and reviewed and anxiety alleviated and reassurance given and a proper investigation for what other, other causes that maybe need to be identified. Here's another one. Look at this. Um, this is not a really a syrinx. This is a, a little incidental finding of, a, of, of probably a dilated central canal that doesn't need anything doing. Here's something a bit more than a dilated central canal. This didn't lead to any uh, intervention at all. And these are purely incidentally detected. Here's a cavernous hemangioma. And so basically, this is very real. And the world is seeing much, much, much more of these. And this is a real problem needs to be dealt with. And some principles to share with everybody is that don't start looking for things that are not worth finding. So be careful who you ask for a scan for. And, and you know, when you do find incidental things, then you need to inform, educate, empower the patient uh, uh, to, to help themselves. And they need to be counseled appropriately with, with tact and wisdom. Uh, so for example, if you detect an aneurysm, you know, some, anu uh, some anu of course, aneurysms are risk of hemorrhage, but the vast, vast majority are not going to bleed. And how you monitor that aneurysm and that, that patient with the aneurysm is, is very important and many ingredients involved. Um, cavernous hemangioma, um, far less risky and almost certainly does not require any, any um, uh, surveillance. And a current malformation just doesn't. So there's different um, regimes for different findings. But all patients need to be counseled appropriately so they're aware of what's going on. And here's the gem that nurse specialists are really required you know, and, and very, very helpful in such roles, rather than um, taking up the time of perhaps surgeons who may be better off dealing with other issues um, uh, and if they need it, then that's fine. But the, the counseling and the information provision and the review can be done by others besides the surgeon. And protocols are very helpful in this field. Um, and, be, and we should be aware of conveyor belted medicine and faceless medicine, where just letters are just simply sent or a protocol is arrived at and, and patients are informed and thinking that's good enough. So we have to be flexible and variable to, to attend to the needs of, of, of all patients. Um, now, those are really just to deal with the asymptomatic concerns. So once again, the conclusion is the vast majority of the QR1 malformations that we certainly see in, in, the, in the industrialized countries are, are incidental and asymptomatic. 
and that's a fact. Now, what do we mean in this presentation, hopefully, with, with, in terms of clarification about what's a Chiari 1 malformation? Um, we're referring to a small posterior fossa with herniation of hindbrain through the foramen magna. That's essentially what we're referring to. Its dimensions, we say five millimeters or more, but this is going to be classified with, with some articles coming out, hopefully, later this year um, by group we're putting together. Um, and we should look at also the deformity in terms of you know, whether there's beaking and impaction and asymmetry of the tonsils uh, coming through a, a, a foramen magna. <clears throat> we should look at the CSF space and obliteration of the CSF spaces. And I think these are three key ingredients to be able to define the severity of the Chiari malformation. Um, volume of posterior fossa, so many ways to measure this. We don't tend to measure it, um, but dimensions are useful when trying to analyze um, the causes and, and also in studies to sort of define what's the cause uh, of chiral malformation. So the distance between the basal and the epistone is key, as well as the width and the association of this condition with atlantoaxial assimilation, clipper file, and scoliosis and other things goes without saying, which we're going to cover. Now, um, as I said, this was first described by Hans Chiari, and there are different causes of the finding. Uh, as we already said, when what he described was essentially a 17 year old with almost certainly a hydrocephalus who died of an unrelated reason and it was an autopsy finding and with a significant Chiari 1 malformation. So one Chiari 1 is not the same as another. It depends what the cause is and what are the causes. But we can classify it into either overcrowding, in other words, underdevelopment of the bony structures in the posterior fossa, uh, and a disproportion between the neural tissue and the bony compartment. We can classify, we can classify the cause from hemodynamic with increased ICP. If the intracranial pressure is high or raises, rises, you will get development of herniation to some extent uh, of the neural structures through the foramen magnum. And this could be chronic and God forbid acute, which is obviously very dangerous. Uh, excess tissue contents, a tumor assist. We're gonna come across these examples. And of course, a low intrathecal pressure. So following insertion of a lumbar peritoneal shunt or a CSF leak or spontaneous intracranial hypotension, this can cause a Chiari appearance. And would you believe it? These examples, I'm going to show some examples of what reasons for referral of Chiari to certainly to my practice. So it's not just detection, it's detection of the cause. And it goes without saying, sounds simple, but they're very easy to, to confuse. Uh, Sometimes it can be easy to confuse and people attend paying attention to the Chiari and saying, let's intervene for that and do a bony decompression, but the problem is actually something else. Now, the embryology of the skull, some useful articles for you. Um, it, it's well and truly defined now that um, there is a cause and there's an association between the small posterior fossa and a Chiari 1 presentation. Um, and this would be the cause for... Uh, certainly from my view, the, the vast majority of, of Chiari 1 malformations that we see. Uh, so they're not from other, other causes or instability or um, raised ICP and so on. And on average, the, 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 the Chicago in 1907 they showed that the Chiari group had a smaller posterior fossa over the dimensions I've written there and a significant difference in, in posterior fossa brain volume to posterior fossa cranial volume um, uh, with the figures described. And the similar things have been described by others and of course, in a periaxial, a nice article with a, looking at the periaxial mesoderm insufficiency, which was vitamin A induced in hamsters, um, you could induce a Chiari, uh, in the, and which was described quite nicely in this article. And so embryologically, you, we can see that there would be a cause behind having a deficient or a tighter or a smaller posterior fossa compartment embry from embryological development, which could cause this. Interestingly, uh, which we're going to come on to also later, is that this is seen in other, uh, um, other animals, um, and particularly dogs. And um, this is very interesting, we'll come on to that. So some examples. We looked at colloid cysts last presentation. So here's a colloid cyst, and there's a nice group we in Chiari, but you don't want to do a de Chiari decompression for this, you treat the cause in the hydrocephalus and the cyst. Um, this, is, this is another tumor that was referred to myself some time ago, and this, is, uh, uh, this was a medalloblastoma. Um, this is a 43-year-old lady um, who, who was referred, believe it or not, as a Chiari, because on the, on the MRI scan for a spine, they just caught the descent of the tonsils 
and then on a subsequent scan they found this tumor um, and this is some of the pictures of the operation and the, the manager was out and she's doing well here's another example a 31 year old bed bound for four weeks poor mobility this was some time ago some years ago when i saw this patient and um, she was initially treated for benign intracranial hypertension uh, or should we say idiopathic intracranial hypertension because there's not much benign about it um, and she had a lumbar peritoneal shunt inserted some 10 years prior to this presentation and after weight loss following gastric procedure um, um, she had done well but she started to deteriorate uh, with the right-sided motor function deficit uh, and far worse than being upright and eventually she became immobile and this was her scan and i can tell you she didn't have a chiral malformation and this small syrinx um, on her previous scans when she had irh uh, or rather it was much more mild so the cause of this was the lumbar peritoneal shunt which was a, an old shunt without a valve on it and uh, with very low resistance the first thing we did was tie that off uh, and obviously she didn't improve but eventually had to do posterior fossa decompression sitting position uh, in this in this young lady but this was another cause and a well-described cause a chiari which is induced by a lumbar peritoneal shunt here's another example now this is a chiari but the cause is the arachnoid cyst and the consequential hydrocephalus so we had to treat the cause the underlying cause in the patient not the scan and here's another example. This is a history, a, a nice story of someone presenting with headache, which was sudden onset. And this is not an uncommon scenario. You'll probably see one or two, but at least a couple a year. Um, and um, um, no prior significant headaches, sudden onset. I think this was while driving, continuous um, and episodically worsening. Um, multiple admissions, Sandy gave up work for a while and um, the headaches were worsened by coughing and sneezing um, but the underlying cause was not a chiari one as a presentation uh, we did some mri scans and images and this was his mri are there any comments from anybody what the cause could be with a sudden onset of headache and um, and headache which would be worse on sitting up um, and, and being upright if there's any anyone wants to make any comments welcome not yet but obviously that is going to be we'll see what, if any of the guys um come up with anything so you're basically saying somebody with a, a, a protrusion of the cerebellum but the headaches are worse when they're sitting upright or standing right. upright. Yes. when and they lay down they improve um yes but of course in this case also after a while when he's lying down after two or three hours trying to sleep at night he also gets headaches so um but the if the initial presentation was a classic sudden onset and clearly worse when he stood up and he and was any, uh, any sudden back pain or was it just a headache um headache that's a good question and as you're alluding to it um the, the problem was what we suspected was a spot was spontaneous intracranial hypotension so this was uh we thought that he's got a spontaneous csf leak and he did he did have that and he went on to have blood patch so the cause of the Chiari is not small posterior fossa. The cause of the Chiari uh, or the worsening of the symptoms, should I say, was intracranial hypotension from the spontaneous CSF leak. And this is not uncommon. Every couple of years, every, every year we see two a year or something like that. And it's well known. And it's a diagnosis that has been much more well, easily detected in the last few years with the advent of MRI and showing duron enhancement and, the, and so on. So some review of the underlying causes, but let's talk more about the Chiari one and especially its association with syringomyelia. So um, in systole, the venous capacitance absorbs pulsation. And if you, you can, we can assume there's about a one mil of CSF moves from cranium to spine and back in diastole. In Chiari, the tonsils move instead. This is one theory and certainly it's a theory that I, I tend to accept because it's what we see during operation and what you see during imaging, dynamic imaging. And in partially entrapped CSF space, there's reduced compliance, and therefore the tonsils act like a piston to produce uh, sort of an increase in intrathecal pressure and an increase in pulse pressure. Um, its prevalence, once again, um, is, is noted to be very variable, but I think of a 1% prevalence is very realistic. And I've put some figures, there were different papers suggesting different things. 
um, and its prevalence, interestingly, is higher in children. Please um, note this because this is well known now. So why is it, you have to think to yourself, it's higher in children and lower in adults? Well, because the cranium grows, so it can resolve. So if you've got a, disp if you've got a, a mismatch between neural content and cranial capacity, it's conceivable that as the child is growing into an adult, that this can resolve, and indeed they do. We have come across cases where children have been followed up into adulthood and you see that the Chiari has resolved. And that's very interesting and, uh, and, and certainly uh, um, a well-recognized fact. Um, so the tonsils can move up and there's several reports of resolution of Chiari syringomyelia, and I've put two of them there and um, uh, et cetera. Um, thought to be slightly increased prevalence in females, but it's not related to obesity. Uh, and we know that now there is no merit in surveillance. Uh, if new symptoms develop, that's a different matter. Symptomatic prevalence is very interesting because this comes down to um, textbook description of its prevalence and its incidence, and then its association with syringomyelia, which was supposed to be 60%. But of course we know that's not true. It cannot be that there's 60% association with syrinx because we now, we now know the vast, 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 vast majority of these. Um, are asymptomatic and, and uh, not causing any problems and just instantly detected. And they certainly don't have a syringe, the bad, almost all of them. But the lower tonsillar position and symptoms is associated with uh, syringe. Here's some of the symptom prevalences in the pediatric population, which I'm gonna jump ahead because there's talk not so much about pediatrics, but I wanted to show you this. This is important. In, in, in adult population, the cough headaches, the tussive headaches are the classic presentation. And one tip I can give is that the headache tends to be the vast majority occipital, at the back of the head. Uh, and, and it tends to be classically with a little delay. Now, this is a point of controversy. Some people will say that's not true. And I can name those conferences when we all meet as, uh, sort of uh, every year. Uh, but the vast majority of us really do believe from the experience, and certainly Graham would say this, um, who, who taught me a lot of this in Birmingham, that there is a classically a short delay, a one second gap perhaps. So they will cough <coughs> and then they get the headache at the back of the head. So this is the most common symptom by far. Of course, neck pain can be there, facial numbness can be there depending on the degree of impaction. Tinnitus can happen, retraction on those uh, eighth, eighth nerve dysphagia, regurgitation, stridor, the sensory motor symptoms, ataxia, of course, and diplopia, but just depends on the degree of compression and severity of the Chiari. Something I wanted to mention to you that it, that it is known to be worsened by trauma, by severe trauma. So if you've got a severe head injury with raised ICP, that can certainly worsen the uh, presentation and make a Chiari uh, much more dangerous. And the only two scenarios where sudden deterioration, uh, to the best of my knowledge and the literature, has occurred is two. One is with onset of meningitis, bacterial meningitis, and, and having a lumbar puncture or bacterial meningitis, and of course, raised ICP in a lumbar puncture. And the other one is following severe trauma, the major head injury and brain swelling. Other than that, there are no reported cases of sudden death or acute deterioration in adults. So this is something that I think is useful for everyone to, to be aware of and remember, because there is even newspaper articles and false uh, um, uh, fake news, if you like, um, that you can suddenly deteriorate with this. Or there was one art newspaper article some years ago in the UK uh, where someone was told, doctors told me, if I laugh, I could die. Uh, yes, it's nonsense. Um, it, it, that's not the case. Also, can I ask you on symptom point of view? So, you know, as you said, this this can be an incidental finding, etc. What do you find as a symptom is the most, not sensitive, but, but the most specific, if you like. So the, the thing that you depend on, which you'll say, do you know what? Okay, this is relevant in your case. Uh, yeah, cough headache, strain related headache. So when they cough, they get a headache. When they bend down to get something out of a cupboard, uh, doing vacuuming, um, um, straining on, on, on the toilet, um, any cause for strain, putting up ICP. But the, and, the, and the location the, of the headache matters it, to you? Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, and, and because it, 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 you know, occipital, back of the head. Uh, 
Okay. And so the migraine is generalized headaches. No, I'm not saying it can't happen. It can, but the classic one, the one that if, if they have this symptom, it's very much associated with the severity of a, of a Chiari and it can be relieved easily, um, most commonly with an operation. That's not to say they all deserve an operation, but it's something that's going to say, well, that's an option. If it's really upsetting you, these headaches, and you can't bear with it, then, then very likely to respond to surgery, uh, which we're going to come on to uh, the next time. But yeah, it's the cough headache and strain-related headaches. Now, um, some little comment about a Chiari 1.5. This has been put about in the literature, and it's, it's, it's not a Chiari 1 or a 2. They're saying, some people are defining this, that you know, it exists and it's a way of classification. And again, it's anatomical. All it refers to, descent of the cerebellar tonsils, a significant portion, whether you call it 5, 7, or 10 millimeters, whatever dimension, past the frame magnum, but also descent of part of the brain stem, at least uh, past the frame magnum, like in this case. For me, it doesn't have any great merit. You can just say, yeah, it's like a really significant Chiari 1. And uh, does it need to be decompressed? Well, it just depends on the symptoms. And you have to, again, do the whole screening and look at, is there hydrocephalus? Is there a tethered cord? Is there a syrinx? And what are the patient's symptoms? So look at these things on imaging and particularly beforehand look at this, the history and examination findings. But it is put out there as, a, as another classification, 1.5. Now, Chiari with syringomyelia. Um, I'm not going to talk huge amounts about cerebromyelia, but I'm going to touch on this uh, to some extent because it is very much related. And this is a subject that's uh, well worth a uh, discussion. And maybe I could invite one day Graham to come and join me this presentation. That would be wonderful. Um, and these slides are from Graham, uh, who shared this with me some, some time ago, uh, from the Anconvoy Trust, which is a wonderful charity that deals with uh, informing patients about Chiari and syringomyelia and providing good, solid use of information, useful information for them to, uh, to be empowered and, and, and help themselves and, and as a good guide towards treatment and management. Um, so Anne Condor, I trust a big shout out to them. Um, now, there were many theories that were put about causation of syringomyelia, especially associated with Chiari malformation. And as a student, I used to like reading about these theories and memorizing them and learning about them as every one of them has come, has been sort of come and gone and criticized that it doesn't always explain, doesn't quite fit with the whole scenario. I've lost a great deal of interest, to be frank with you, regarding that. But um, let's review them because they, they, they are relevant. Gardner and Angel theory proposed in 1959, so it's a Chiari 1 with the cystic syringomyelia, underlying hydrocephalus, and it was a proposed, uh, proposed that the occlusion of the frame of Magendi, which is in the midline, and Lushka, which are laterally, so remember Magendi, midline, Lushka, laterally, the CSF is forced in central canal by the obex and uh, driven by correct plexus pulsations. Um, doesn't quite fit with, uh, there are many arguments against this, but we're not gonna go into that, but it, it was uh, very valid for, for a long time. Bernard's theory, um, some good presentations about this on, on YouTube, please do look this up. And, and he found a good dissociation between ventricular uh, EVD pressures and CSF and ones that were measured from the spine and essentially um, he thought that the hydrocephalus was not the underlying cause. The important factor was obstruction to the CSF below the cranial vertebral junction and, um, and, and this was identified following, following detection of craniospinal pressure dissociation. So when you measured the pressure waveform in the head and the spine there was a delay and there was a dissociation. And therefore, the valvular effect of the tonsillar herniation were thought to be the responsible uh, for this, and also the importance of venous pressure waves. But of course, this has been uh, criticized later on. But uh, Bernard was a giant in this field and uh, a remarkable man. Ball and Dyer, 1972, they thought it was movement of intrathecal water soluble contrast media um, uh, via, via detection via water soluble contrast media. And they thought it was via a transparent chymal flow uh, rather than by the obex in the fourth ventricle. And they thought that the root behind all of this, the causation of syringomyelia, was along the perivascular spaces. Again, there's many arguments against this. And more recently, the, the Oldfield theory, uh, Heist and Oldfield in 1999, uh, where um, they thought there's the piston like action of the tonsil during systole. And this is very attractive for me. Um, it, it really does fit that somehow the piston effect would be the causation or a big contribution to driving CSF into the cord. Of course, other theories have been put. Um, I loved 
to have a session with, with uh, Professor Coel, who's a giant in neurosurgery, really, and his paper and his description regarding what he's termed as the nature's airbag, which could be the case. But um, I believe, and certainly others do, that the instability at C1, C2 is for a group, a subset of patients that can present with acute malformation, not the vast majority. And we may be wrong, maybe he's right, but I, I, we haven't seen the evidence for that, but it'd be lovely to talk about that. There's also other theories, but like the volume change theory, that the spinal canal volume is greater in flexion and extension, and this was put in the paper, and, and, and the movement of flexion extension with a slight predisposition can, can cause uh, syrinx formation. Personally thinking, I think there's no one cause. Even when you don't find any other underlying cause on imaging and, and during examination, um, it, it, it surely it's not one cause for everybody who has got a QR in a syringe and a syrinx. But the important thing is treat the underlying pathology and do what works and do no harm. Now, um, I've written there uh, Cavalier, King Charles Spaniel, and Griffin Bruxelois, and there's some other comments afterwards. Is anyone familiar why I put these two names there at the top? If there's any comments from anybody. Yeah. <laughs> any comments? Anyone want to say anything? What do they know? What's the association between Cavalier King Charles Spaniel and Griffin Bruxelois and this subject? Well, so um, in the Chiari, in the Syringomatic meeting 2018, it was one of the excellent lectures, was by Claire Rusbridge, who's a vet, and she's really world authority on this subject. And the two names at the top are two breed of dogs. Uh, in which Chiari malformation with Syringomalia is well recognized. And um, you can go and look up numerous videos about dogs presenting with Syringomalia and Chiari and, and how uh, they present and, and how they essentially scratch themselves and how they are unhappy in the pain and discomfort they're in. And, and, and it happens and it's a well recognized thing. And these are the, some pictures of uh, the one on the left is Cavalier King Charles Spaniel breed and Griffin Bruxelois is on the right. And, of course, it happens in other dogs such as Chihuahua, et cetera, and, and it's to do with the breed and what we've done to sort of breed these particular size shapes as uh, skull dogs. Um, and uh, here you go with some pictures via the internet about uh, how one has got a Chiari Slingomalia and one doesn't. And um, so it's interesting how the same pathology can happen uh, within another species um, for same reasons perhaps with a mismatch between the size of the skull and the neural contents. Um, and the, the symptoms that can happen in dogs um, is pain and they won't tell you I'm in pain but they look uncomfortable, they look unhappy, they will moan, they will scratch themselves and, and even uh, go for the back of the head, their posture, their sleeping position, neck scratching, behavioral changes, uh, ataxia. Uh, this is an interesting paper from 2012, where <clears throat> they hypothesized the volume reduction of the jugular foramen in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels with syringomyelia. <clears throat> this was spotted and seen on imaging, and a hypothesis that was put that the cerebral venous drainage capacity determines whether or not the Chiari patient would deliver syringomyelia. So this was very interesting, I thought. Uh, and the hypothesis sort of summarized there. So it's interesting that this is even more reason to think there's not one cause for everybody. It, it could be mismatch, it could be a venous thing, it's a pulse pressure thing, there's an, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's not a disease, it's an anatomical finding essentially to begin with, and then possibly further pathological findings like syringomyelia, et cetera. Um, and really the treatment for syringomyelia, the principles there I've just put there, um, which you're not going to talk about as, uh, as the main subject, is to create, uh, if you treat the underlying cause, and if that doesn't make it go away, then you create a conduit for normal CSF flow, or you drain, the next stage you drain the syringe directly, uh, or you can try lowering the overall CSF pressure, or conservative management if um, if patient is in agreement and on balance is the right thing to do. Something I'm going to touch upon, because I think it's very important, is the concept of syrinx and no syrinx. And, and for neurosurgeons um, who are in this field, I'm sure they light up because this is a big issue. Once again, if you do MRI scans of the spine, particularly cervical thoracic spine, you will find lots and lots of 
so-called syrinxes or dilated central canal or a spindle. And the radiologist will say, seek help from a neurosurgeon. Um, and um, this is another cause of another source for vomit, victims of modern imaging technology. But it needs to be addressed. So Pettit et al. Uh, in his paper, they found that um, around 1.5% of all MRIs show what they would call as a dilated central canal as a non serine structure. And that definition would be that the, 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 the cavity that is seen uh, with the white uh, sort of the fluid filled CSF space is 0.4 millimeters or less in diameter. And of course, it's, it's not associated with any horse strations um, and certainly no contrast enhancement uh, uh, with any pathological finding. And these are extremely common. And I've shown you some examples there with the help of previous. This is a slide from which Graham had shared with me before. Um, you can define one on the left as just simply spindle, persistent central canal, a second uh, from the left. A dilated central canal uh, and, and a fully formed syrinx is, is what you've got on the right. And sometimes you can't just say, look at a scan and go, yeah, that's a dilated central canal. If you're suspicious, then you need to repeat the scan and do a surveillance image, uh, imaging and then do one with contrast enhancement. So, but it is a real issue where the vast, vast majority we know are just dilated central canal and just a benign finding. Nothing needs to be done. Would um, you depend on the size for that, Mulsa, or what, what's the what sort yeah. of image findings? Which... No, it's a good question. I think um, uh, a, la a, a, a criteria that's been given is anything less than 0.4 millimeters, uh, sorry, um, uh, anything less than 4 millimeters in diameter is, is, is a good safety margin, but it can't be just taken categorically across the board the length of abnormality. So if you've got a, 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 a long length of a sliver, a very slight dilated cavity, that's almost certainly going to be a persistent central canal. But if you've got a ballooned cavity, particularly, sorry, have we got a bleeder? Um, How are we doing, John? John? Dealing with it. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> So if you've got a, if you have a, a, a big focal dilatation, that's much more likely to be a syrinx. If you've got an irregular dilatation, then really that's alarming. If you've got horse strations where you've got a dilatation and then a membrane, another dilatation, that's very alarming. Um, and of course, if in doubt, you do a, a, a contrast enhanced scan. And then if that doesn't show any abnormality, that's very reassuring, then do one surveillance imaging. Um, but it, there's not one set formula, but a, a good one is to look at the width, the diameter, the length of the dilatation, any irregularity, and certainly any enhancement. But once again, the vast majority of these are just not syrinx at all for the reasons described. I hope that helps anyway. Um, here's a picture of a nice Chiari and a syrinx. I mean, there's no doubt about that, uh, the size of that cavity. Um, and I, Maybe I should wait for at all for the next next time that, to join. But this is one of the other groups and hypotheses that's been put, and, and quite an important uh, you know um, article where um, at all had proposed his group long time really that not just in 2015 that Atlanta axial instability is the cause of Chiari malformation. Uh, outcome of 65 patients treated by Atlanta axial fixation um, and um, uh, he actually uh, devised and, and uh, proposed a new fixation technique, really, for C1C2, a long time ago for this. Uh, and essentially, uh, they were saying that the surgical results described it as to speculate that chronic, uh, chronic malformation can be nature's protective mechanism that assists in reducing the effect of instability and cord compression by the odontoid process. Um, and he said that we speculate chronic, chronic malformation may have an an airbag type of influence that prevented pinching of vital neural structures between the bones. Now, I, it's a kind of belief thing with this. I personally, and, and I don't mean in disrespect, I don't believe this uh, as, as, uh, as the cause, but I know that the re his results are very good for this. And if you do a fixation where there's clear instability, it can uh, help the situation and regress. Great, I think that's fantastic. 
whether you call it nature's airbag, I mean, I don't know why nature would move cerebellar tonsil somehow to round the upper cord to act as, a, as an airbag. I mean, I'm not sure what protection that will offer. Um, maybe to reduce movement by, by tension and increasing headache. But let's say that does happen, fine, because um, things odd things happen with, with organs moving. Look at the uh, uh, abdominal policeman, the, the greater omentum. We know that will move to seal a perforation. Maybe there is such a thing as this a proposal, and that's fine. But what's for certain is that the vast majority of cases of QRE we see, this doesn't apply because there is no instability. So I think there's a subset of patients and which may be much more common, particularly in India and in vast patient population who have got instability, who have got really a primary cranial cervical or cranial vertebral junction anomaly and problem that this applies to. But the vast majority of problems we see with Kiari are not related to this. And this is from Atoll's article. And you can see, look, I mean, you've got cranial settling, so I don't have a pointer here, but you can see the dent is in the cranium in, in one of these scans. So the kind of anomalies that you see in this particular article where the patients treated are not the same as the Chiaris that we see in everyday practice. Uh, this is a different, uh, this is a subset of patients with, uh, with craniovertebral anomalies and um, potentially connective tissue disorders and, and so on and so forth. And there's a whole range of problems here. There's basal invagination, there's um, uh, um, major de deformities here. So I'm going to skip ahead and I'm going to, just to make the point, I've gone and just looked at, for, so for some, some years, I used to do x-rays for instability on all Chiari 1 patients who presented. Not one showed any instability. So I'm just showing some examples. So this is one. This is a flexion extension, no movement. This is another one, no movement. I'm sorry, I could just show you this all day. This, this is another one. It's supposed to be Dallas uh, Ellis Danlos variant, and we did flexion extension MRI, no significant change. I'm going to come back to this pathology in a while. Um, and here's an 18 year old um, with this scan and significant Chiari with impaction and no instability. Uh, here's a 22 year old um, uh, with significant Chiari and, and symptoms, and again, no instability. Um, Here's another one with a, a DNET tumor in the head as well, and x-rays and no instability. Um, here's one with severe cough headaches awaiting surgery, so significant Chiari, uh, and another one, and no instability. I mean, the list goes on and on. So we haven't seen this, and, and know the vast majority of colleagues that, uh, that um, I work with in, the, uh, in this part of the world, but I think we may be getting two different pathologies, two, uh, two different things mixed up here. And it's, it's unbelievable how this can happen uh, for intelligent uh, co colleagues. Um, so I think it's, it's good well, to- I think, uh, well, Also, as you say, there may well be sort of a different subset of population. And, and that is, we do see that clearly with different patients, different pathologies in different regions. Yes. And yeah. the, but I think, I mean, yeah, just moving away from dogma, I mean, it's just something to be aware of anyway. Because, and as, we, as you know, we, um, we, when we, we sit in the MDT, we often do, do, do the flexion extensions, do a CT scan. We look for any abnormality between the C1 and C2 joints. So we're aware of it. And I think that, in my opinion, is something important as well. Oh, sure, absolutely. I think it's well said. Look, you know yourself recently, we um, even one, one case recently, we're going to do a joint case, I think on one with instability. But it's a clear anomaly with a cranial cervical junction and in, in instability and a, and a congenital spine problem. And he has a chiari and a syringomyelia, which is significant. But that's different. That's not the cranial cerebral disproportion with a small posterior fossa and nothing else going on. Um, so I think it's useful to mention this because you know, we can't be dogmatic about it, as you say, to say it's still wants to fix it isn't. Clearly it isn't. Otherwise, the rest of the world would be doing this. Um, there's some, some more scans with uh, various symptoms. 
and um, here's a 22 year old with minimal symptoms offered for conservative management despite having this syrinx there so just because you see a syrinx the old school way of saying you've got a sinus in the Chiari surgery. No, the patient's perfectly entitled to say, no, I'm, I'll just continue with surveillance for this. But at the age of 22, I did advise against it. I said, I prefer, I might offer, I would recommend intervention. And uh, she did eventually come back and have surgery for that. Um, this is a 32 year old with incidentally injected Chiari. Incidentally, look at the degree of impaction and the descent. It looks significant. And you can clearly see the posterior fossa. Uh, is kind of you know small for this for this structure, and no other underlying thing. Um, this is a case of um, um, cluster headaches, as was defined by a neurologist, as well as generalized headaches related to Chiari, with some occipital headaches, which were cough headaches. But the main issue you can see here, as you can see, Rafid, and I'm sure others can see, is is the hydrocephalus. You've got a depression of the floor of the third ventricle and a bowing out of the lamina terminalis. And, and this is, the, you know, you, we shouldn't be going ahead doing a Chiari here. You should be treating and paying attention to the hydrocephalus, if anything, first. So if you need, do ICP monitoring if in doubt, but you treat the underlying cause. So with, with all Chiaris, we have to think is there an underlying cause? An image, the head. And the entire spine if they're symptomatic. And in the head, you're looking for hydrocephalus, so any lump, bump, cyst, any cause for raised pressure. And the spine, you're looking for syrinx or a tethered cord and, and such anomaly. Um, and we're going to come back to that by what investigations. Now, something which is very topical and for experts in this field to know about um, is a controversial uh, diagnosis where uh, this paper is referring to it um, and so is this one by Henderson in the United States and uh, these are colleagues that we get together with in meetings um, because there is a, a subset of patients who are thought to have hypermobility spectrum disorder. Now this is different to just Ellis Danlos. I hope everyone can hear me. Ellis Danlos, you know, the prevalence about let's say one in 5,000 population, 13 different types more recently uh, described there's some suggestions gone up to 20 now when i was a medical student there was only seven and um and this is they, they can present with a whole range of uh, problems not just you know uh, skin elasticity and joint problems and, and musculoskeletal issues um but you know uterine rupture vascular disorders aneurysms and so on um, and it can be a very disabling problem but we know now increasingly from various patient groups and reports that there is a group of patients who have not LS Danlos, but have some degree of hypermobility, and particularly following an accident or an event, can have a range of symptoms which are uh, difficult to pin down, and some would say would require, uh, for certainly for neck pain and Chiari type uh, symptoms, a craniosubical fixation. Extremely controversial. I don't know of any neurosurgeon in the United Kingdom who offers this surgery. The surgery is done for lots of other conditions. And people have raised money through crowdfunding and things to go uh, to Europe to have this surgery done um, in Barcelona or in the United States. And uh, I have much sympathy with, with patients because we don't know the real cause to this day, what's, what's the cause behind this. But it is an increasingly recognized problem which needs to be researched and identified more. And essentially, the, the premise is that there is a hypermobility spectrum disorder where it's not just one in 5,000 population, it's much more likely to be perhaps 1% of the population who have hypermobility and a predisposition uh, to such symptoms. I'm not talking about the 10% of the population who have hypermobility, um, but this, this is related to patients who can have by definition, as uh, from, from Smith, who's a radiologist in London, uh, he, he does upright MRI for such patients, and he's put his criteria as what is detected as uh, that the cerebellar tonsils do not descend like they do in the midline, but this is more lateral depressions uh, and, and protrusions of the cerebellar tonsils in this group of patients who also have 
some element of cranial and cervical laxity and instability as defined by his dimensions, which I've, which I've put here for you. It's very controversial, once again, because it creates a big headache. You don't see a significant cure. There's no impaction. There is no, um, there is no um, obliteration of CSF space. So you wouldn't look at the scan and more importantly, look at the patient and say, I'm going to offer an operation to you, which is potentially, um, you know, which has potential complications. And very, you know, I'm not sure if it's ever going to help you with your symptoms. But a certain number of these patients have gone and had craniosurvical fixation without any studies, effective studies yet being done at the moment, and have benefited, although some haven't benefited, and some have ended up much worse, sadly. But this is an area of controversy, and I'm just notifying, I'm just putting it there for sharing experience and to say this is an area where a lot more work needs to be done, um, and uh, things are just not clear. So common questions, this is very important, and coming to the end of this particular presentation, is that um, common questions come up with Chiari. One is, is there any merit in surveillance? The answer is no. Generally, no. So if you've got someone with incidentally detected Chiari malformation, you know, protrusion of cerebral tonsils five millimeters or more, and it's incidentally detected the patient as well, no need to do any surveillance, absolutely not. Now, if you've got someone who's very anxious, particularly if it's uh, a significant protrusion, but a degree of impaction, and, um, uh, and et cetera, then I would say it's good to have surveillance clinically to let them know what to look out for in case anything develops, particularly if they're young, and uh, if any symptoms develop, then do a scan. If you do a scan for simple reassurance because they're very anxious and you do one in two years, make sure they're not getting a syrinx or something like that, that's not unreasonable. So we have to be tactful and wise, but for someone who's asymptomatic and it's mild, absolutely not. Is there any sudden deterioration seen? Once again, the answer is no. So if patients are asking us, Doctor, is there any chance that I could suddenly deteriorate, God forbid, drop dead, become paralyzed, etc.? The answer is no. And if you think about it, it will be no. Because if you have almost 1% of humanity who have this kind of finding, and let's say you know, one tenth of that proportion is much more severe. And so far in modern medicine and history, there's been no description of sudden deterioration and coning and, uh, and neurological damage, which surely would have been done. That's proof by itself. And that principle would apply to pregnancy. So we know that ladies who are pregnant can have a Chiari, but there's not even one case of sudden deterioration or death or rapid or, or, or uh, any major harm following pregnancy or during pregnancy. Just you can get symptoms getting a bit worse, but no massive or sudden deterioration. The only time it can happen in theory, although, and I know I've only, I've heard of two, legal cases uh, worldwide is that if you have a significant Chiari and you've had a spinal anesthetic and had a leak and, and a CSF a leak, then you can have that. So it's best to avoid a spinal in, 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 a, in a patient who's got a significant uh, Chiari malformation with impaction. Um, I think that's just good, sensible advice. But can they have normal pregnancy, normal delivery? Yeah. Do they need a cesarean? No. Incidentally, majority of patients and, and clinicians we give this advice to sadly still end up having, from my experience, uh, or a decent proportion end up having a cesarean because it's perhaps a safer thing to do or whatever. But there is certainly no uh, uh, risk in pregnancy from the literature and from what we know. Um, imaging. Do you need um, any special imaging like flow studies? Now they're becoming more common. The problem is that flow studies take time to do. And I, and I love the more advanced CSF studies, but they take extra time. And you have to think to yourself, is this worth it? Is it providing any more information that I really need? And my answer to that generally is no, it's not necessary. Do I request it sometime? Yep, because if I'm in doubt about something, let's say someone is going to have a spinal procedure or a um, what I'm going to operate on, I want to do a comparison before and after, or they've got a, um, uh, or they've got to uh, have a, um, a spinal anesthetic for some reason, and we really want to know, is it 
uh, belt and brace that there is good flow across the Krenzelwald junction, then I think there are indications for doing flow studies. But as a routine on everybody, as is becoming common in very advanced health systems, which are lucrative and private, uh, then um, my answer to that still is no, it's not necessary. Um, but an MRI of the brain, an entire spine, is indicated for all symptomatic Chiari. Um, uh, to look at whether there's syrinx, whether there's hydrocephalus, whether there's a tethered cord and such things. And only do imaging of the spine in terms of dynamic imaging, flexion extension or CT or MR, if you suspect instability. Uh, and in conclusion, therefore, Chiari 1 malformation is not a disease. It's a definition that remains vague and anatomical. It's most often incidental finding in the modern uh, practice in the developed countries. It's, it can be a manifestation and not a primary detection. So therefore, beware of hydrocephalus and raised ICP and tethered cord and syrinx and craniosophical anomalies. So don't treat it as the primary finding because it could be a secondary to one of these, which is the most important thing from a neurosurgical perspective. It's like medical student stuff, really, or basic examination stuff. If you see a signal theory, say, is there hydrocephalus? Is there raised ICP? Is there a tethered cord? Is there a syrinx? And any other anomaly of cranial junction, and that's it. And you've done, you've done your primary work radiologically. When clinically significant, you've got to think: is it low lying and impacted tonsils? What's the CSF space is like, and is there reduced flow, which will help you to kind of judge its judge its severity. Uh, investigation for symptomatic cases, as we've already said, is an MRI of the brain, MRI entire spine. If you suspect instability, then do some dynamic imaging. Remember that children can grow out of Chiari 1 malformation and the syrinx can improve spontaneously. This is an important message. Can a syrinx, a syrinx if you like, improve spontaneously? The answer is yes. Do the vast majority improve spontaneously? No, but they can do. Um, and they said they don't necessarily need operation or intervention just because it's there. You can have someone with a syrinx who's quite well, no significant symptoms, and you can monitor them. I'm not saying that's the common practice, that's what should be done. I am alarmed when I see a syrinx with Chiari and I tend to offer intervention, but it's not absolute that it's imperative. Patients clearly can, uh, can opt not to have intervention. Um, once again, the Chiari is not, Chiari malformation is not associated with sudden deterioration or sudden death. The only time this is not the case is in severe major head injury causing raised ICP, and the other scenario is following um, severe meningitis with raised ICP and someone having a lumbar puncture. And there's no danger but natural childbirth. Uh, important to say to treat the cause, if uncertain, do ICP monitoring. And surgery for Chiari should be the last resort. Should be the last resort, whichever operation you use. I think we'll stop there at the moment. Um, I hope that was enough for the first stage there. Next stage is the operative operative techniques, which should be more fun. Any anything to discuss, Rafi? Uh, well, th thank you for your presentation. I I um, wish to uh, just uh, throw in one or two comments and ask a question. Sure. Um, can you hear? Hello. Go ahead, Daddy. Can you? Hear me? Okay, thank you for your presentation and, and um, I, just a few issues I needed to raise. And um, the first being the issue of nomenclature, uh, disease, carry disease, carry uh, manifestation, carry malformation. And um, it, it makes me uh, kind of um, uh, get concerned because sometimes this becomes an issue when we talk about secondary carry, uh, which is uh, induced by uh, either a procedure or something going on. How do you go about this? Secondly, I wanted to ask you if you have a specific protocol for syrinx and um, what do you do uh, if you find it and have you found that often where there is a coexistence of hydrocephalus? with a syrinx and um, what do you do uh, bearing in mind that some syrinx may resolve spontaneously thank you no problem most welcome um i'm sorry there was a bit of uh, interference but i think if i heard correctly 
Uh, you had some concerns about endometriture. I'm sorry if, if it sounded a bit confusing, but I, I agree with you if your sentiment is that it's not a disease. It isn't. A Chiari is a, is a, still remains a vague label, but it's an anatomical definition, and um, very few things are really a disease. Um, and I think it's absolutely right that it's a manifestation sometime of underlying other causes. Uh, and sometimes just purely incidentally detected because of the beautiful way some of us are made. And that's it. It's not a, not a problem at all. It can be just left alone. Your question regarding um, syrinx and hydrocephalus, is there a protocol? Um, yeah, generally there's a, a good guidance, but I don't have a, a chart to kind of right now share with you. Um, but if you see a syrinx, it is alarming. It shouldn't, it's not healthy. And it doesn't mean that the patient is doomed to deterioration, no. But absolutely, we should look for underlying cause. So the first thing to do is to see and examine the patient. Have they got any symptoms or signs related to it? Do they have any sensory motor symptoms? Any spinal thalamic involvement? What are the reflexes like? The first thing, as you know, that goes is the abdominal reflex quite often is a very early sign. Uh, and, and to be able to document and chart what the patient has got in terms of symptoms and any neurological findings, any brisk reflexes and so on. And then you chart that and document what the patient's like at the time. And then you also have to have appropriate imaging. The appropriate imaging, which is mandatory, is imaged ahead of the cephalus, which should be treated generally if there's a syrinx uh, and any obstruction to the, to the flow, for example, a Chiari, um, but not always needs treatment. And of course, to a contrast enhanced MRI scan, contrast enhanced MRI scan to unrule out any underlying primary spinal intradural intraparenchymal pathology. Um, and other things that can, of course, cause it is even, for example, a vascular anomaly or a durovenous fistula. So, and then once you've ruled out any, you've treated the underlying cause, if the patient's got a symptomatic syrinx or a syrinx which is growing, then, and if there's none of that, no underlying cause, then as I put the treatment protocol is, you can um, uh, uh, treat, drain the syrinx directly, and you can do syringo pleural shunt, syringo a subarachnoid shunt, there's the Williams procedure, and all depends what the objective is and what the pathology looks like and the imaging and the underlying cause. And you can even treat some syrinxes with just simply um, uh, a lumbar puncture, series of lumbar punctures, which, which uh, can help in symptomatic syrinxes if, if you don't want to drain the syrinx itself. So, and sometimes just CSF diversion, whether it's a, lump, uh, a VP shunt or a lumbar peritoneal shunt uh, is, is can be a good idea. We are talking about fine print stuff now because I can't give it to you in one short sentence or a, or a short presentation, but the, there is a good monologue of this um, and um, I can share that with you. Um, and uh, there's a good sessions and, and, and literature on this, particularly from Graham Flint on this, and uh, we can share that later on with you. Um, but essentially, not all syrinx needs treatment. It's detection of the underlying cause, treatment of the underlying cause, particularly if it's a worrying cause, like an intradural intra, intra paracarmal pathology, uh, and, uh, and surveillance uh, for a, uh, a syrinx which is of significant size or, or symptomatic, at least, if not intervention, uh, and intervention on the lines of which we discussed. Well, so thanks. Um, this has been a great talk. I've had a lot of compliments from the chaps listening, uh, which is always nice to see. And I mean, the physiology for this is obviously important and not everything is understood as you're pointing out. Uh, but I think, yeah, you need to grasp on the theories to, to sort of start understanding how to treat it. And, and it varies a lot, doesn't it? And from, just from a practical sense, I mean, for me personally, when I see a Chiari and I'm sort of working it up as a standard, I would be getting imaging for the brain to rule out, as you said, something I'm just like thinking about a practical take home message for some yeah. of the guys. I would always get brain imaging to rule out something compressive, which is pretty much routine now and, and a whole spine to rule out a tethering or, or something um, down below. And I guess in the rare instance of, of um, hypo, hypotension um, or CSF leak, was, was that, was, would that be sort of accurate? And, I, and the other thing as we've spoken about a lot is um, if there is any query at all from the supratensorial compartment, then, I tend to think about doing an ICP monitor. Do you have any comments on all of those? And there's a couple of questions from the guys. I'll, I'll pass them on when I, when I hear comments on that. 
Okay, I think there's a few questions, quite a lot of questions there. I, I can read them, I'm just trying to focus on what you're saying and the question. But um, what you said about it, you know, take home messages and imaging is absolutely right. And ICP monitoring, I'll come back to again. So once again, it's if you if you get a referral for someone with a Chiari, is see the patient. But this is one case, particularly in the modern uh, industrialized world where so many of these incidental look at the scan and see how severe it is. How much descent of the cerebral tonsil have you got? Is there CSF space around it? And so if it's low cerebral tonsil descent, you know, not, not you know, five millimeters or less, and particularly if there's no deformity, compact, impaction, and beaking, particularly if there's no, uh, if there's good CSF space around there, highly unlikely this patient requires anything. And important to look at uh, what symptoms the patient got, if any. If you've got a significant Chiari, that there is CSF space obliteration or the descent of the tonsils is more than five millimeters and it looks deformed and it just looks severe, and or the patient is symptomatic, then I would do, and we've got a paper coming out on this, uh, imaging of the brain, entire brain, to make sure there's no hydrocephalus underlying cause and the entire spine. Okay. And that would be minimum. But certainly not all patients with cerebellar tonsillar descent, five millimeters beyond the frame of magnum, require entire brain and, and spine MRI. No. So only when relevant, basically. And um, also we've got a, a couple of questions from our colleague Carlos in Spain. And first of all, he's asking about, do you have any comments about the change in the classification of, um, of Chiaris? I don't know if you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that in the beginning, uh, probably. Well, you mentioned what you thought was, felt was significant, but any comments about the change in the in the naming of what's a Chiari one and a Chiari zero and all, all the rest of it? Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of grievances, and I think this needs to be sorted out. And by grievances, we meaning the sort of the classification of Chiari zero. If anyone's mentioned that Chiari zero refers to a, a, a group of subset of patients, and please bear with me on this because there, there is a, some controversy here and a personal <laughs> disagreements with this as well. Uh, patients who, who have symptoms, so cough, headaches, and, and a whole range of potential sensory motor symptoms, and, but haven't got a tonsillar descent of five millimeters. It might be just two millimeters or three or not significant. But if they have surgery and decompression, they get better. Now, I haven't come across such patients because we don't tend to do that kind of surgery in the United Kingdom. And when I've had my arm twisted to do that, I've regretted it. Uh, and, but the, the, the patient uh, accepted the risks and so on and so forth. And it was an MDT combined decision as a group. Um, and I think that's personal experience. And I don't agree with this Chiari Zero. I have a hard time accepting it. Furthermore, and please reflect on this. It's very easy to say someone's symptoms could be attributable to a very benign, common anatomical finding. And then you do, for example, a bony decompression and they get a bit better. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a hard time accepting this. What we need is good studies, scientific data and information in a randomized trial or a good trial to show the benefits. And that is severely lacking in Chiari Zero for sure. Chiari 1.5 is yeah, it's a, it's a description. It, I'm not sure if it's really that helpful. But certainly what we need to do is do better for classifying the severity of Chiari. And I know Paolo uh, Bolognese has published on this and others to try and come up with long, longer classification as a quick, short, sharp way of describing the severity of the Chiari 1 malformation. Now, we're going to work together to try and improve on this by having a simple classification, which will look at degree of descent, impaction degree, so whether there's beaking, deformity, asymmetry of the tonsils, and whether there's CSF space obliteration. I think these would be three key features to, to look at. And these yeah, three... There's a, there's a lot more that, than to meet, that meets the eye as with anything else, isn't there? That it's not just the, the pure millimeters. Absolutely. And, 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 but the problem is that you know yourself, as all the uh, colleagues know, that what makes a classification attractive is if it's simple and short. Yeah. So for example, if you look at um, Hakim's triad for NPH, 
why everyone knows it is because it's just a triad, you know, gait, incontinence, cognition, uh, dementia. Uh, but if you're going to throw in classification that is, um, uh, you know, let's say pick a spinal one about classification of indications for spinal decompression, the tumor, as, as you've described, how many there are? There's quite a few. And, and people, if you ask them, can you remember, give me the breakdown, the scoring system for this? The, the, the more the scoring system, the more complex it gets, the, the more reluctance to use it. True. Um, and uh, so that's not to say we shouldn't justify good measurements and criteria, but it has to be, it has to be justifiable to say, okay, I'm even going to use a calculator here on basis of a complex scoring system to score something which is relevant for this patient. But it has to be scientifically based, and that is still lacking and very difficult to derive on that. But I think these three features on Chiari will be will, on Chiari one will be relevant. Um, uh, we, we could talk a lot more about this because there's so much done on 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 classifications and the scoring. I mean, for example, why is it five millimeters? Why is it not four? Why is it not seven? I mean, all, uh, with all of these things, they're somewhat arbitrary. The more you look at them and understand it, the less you sort of, unless you know, it seems. <laughs> We got another question from uh, Gerald Musa, um, also who's asking a more theoretical one, which is if somebody has um, cerebellar descent and a Chiari one, <coughs> he's asking if they would be at higher risk of brainstem early brainstem compression in the event of a high ICP from any other reason. I guess that's probably yes, but not so much relevant clinically because if there is something which is going to be causing that compression, it's going to show up anyway. Or um, so, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so um, <coughs> I know of two cases where, um, and one of them medical legally, and um, Marcus Studley from Australia, we, we all get together, uh, and he's, he's quite an expert on this in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia, Marcus is excellent on this. He, he knows of several more that have come medical legally where patients have deteriorated rapidly acutely with a, with a Chiari. And as I said, it's only happened in two scenarios. One, if the ICP has gone up really high for any reason, such as acute trauma pushing up the pressure. And the other one is bacterial meningitis, which has caused raised pressure within the head, and then they've had a lumbar puncture, which has obviously made a Chiari even worse to kind of cause coning and impaction. So we should be aware of when someone has got a significant Chiari radiologically. I'm not talking a little bit of descent and there's plenty of CSF space. I'm talking about when there's B kink and there's degree of impaction and you're worried about any other cause of raised ICP. So do be aware. But the two scenarios I know of medical legally and in the literature that I've presented is only those that I've mentioned. Okay, that's fantastic. So... I think we can uh, wrap up today, John. Thank you, Monzo. That's a great talk. And um, we've decided that um, ne next Thursday, 7 p.m. is our usual time and on, on this sort of series of talks. And I'll, and I'll talk about cervical myelopathy and some surgical strategies and principles. And that's on Thursday. Sure. No, that'd be good. And then um, on Saturday, we'll... Have we decided yet? We haven't decided yet on Saturday. Okay. Well, I'll consult with John. I'm quite keen as one individual for, for Atoll to join the operative intervention talk because um, this sub well, let's, let's that's, gonna be, that's gonna be that's gonna be you know a presentation hopefully with a lot of pictures well, and, 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 and a few videos. Aim for seven PM Saturday and, and we'll send it to him and if he can make it that's great. If not, you can always delay it and yeah, if, if you guys could just give me a couple of dates, so I'll just tell him. Yeah, sure. Okay. No, no, that would be that would be good. And I think that's going to be something more more dynamic. And uh, you know, when we talk about <laughs> operating, that's that's going to be fun. So, so, John, give him a date of seven p.m. next Saturday for at all, and then Thursday seven p.m. I'll I'll give cervical myelopathy to. Okay. All well, right. We'll take him when he can do it. <laughs> Just the one <laughs> anytime. I mean, he's such a great teacher. Everyone's seen him, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really it is really wonderful. Good. I'm not a neurosurgeon, but man, what a teacher. <laughs> but uh, so anyways, thanks a lot, guys. Great job. Okay. God oh, bless. Take stick care. Up, stick oh, around. I'm going to do a commercial. <laughs> Great job. Thank you very much.